Hi, folks. Um, my name is uh, Kerry Cranston. Uh, I am the president of the American Writers Museum, and I want to welcome you to this virtual event of the American Writers Museum. We'll give everyone a minute to kind of get into the room and find their seats, so to speak. Um, when we launch these events, it usually takes a few minutes for all of the attendees uh, to become visible or to be able to see the program. Um, and we're very thrilled to have you join us for this virtual program with former U.S. Poet Laureate Juan Felipe Herrera in honor of his new book, Every Day We Get More Illegal. As you watch the event, if you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you look to the bottom um, and if uh, you'll see a little button that says Q&A, click that. You can type in a question and we will be looking at those um, a little bit later in the program and reading them out. Um, if you're one of the students joining us, um, when you type your question, if you could also type in the name of your school and your first name, that would be great. Um, today we're welcoming students from Argo Community High School, Chicago Math and Science Academy, Lynn Bloom Math and Science Academy, and Phoenix Military Academy to this event uh, through the generosity of our youth education sponsors. Um, we apologize in advance if we don't get to all of your questions, but we'll do our best to ask as many of them as possible. And if you'd like to purchase a copy of the book and receive a signed book plate, you should visit our book selling partner at Seminary Co-op during this event for that exclusive opportunity. We'll drop the link in the chat to you all. Um, now at this point, I'd like to introduce Christina Carrera uh, from the American Writers Museum who will be interviewing our special guest today. So I'm gonna hand it over now to Christina. Thank you, Carrie, and welcome everyone, especially our students. For more information about our education programming, please visit our website at AmericanWritersMuseum.org. This is the latest program in our Jean and John Rowe series, My America, Immigrant and Refugee Writers Today. You can see the exhibit of the same name online, along with educational resources and downloads at my-america.org. Today, we'll be speaking with Juan Felipe Herrera. In 2015, he was appointed the 21st United States Poet Laureate, the first Mexican-American to hold the position. In a statement of choice, Librarian of Congress James H. Billington said Herrera's poems contained Whitman-esque multitudes that championed voices and traditions and histories as well as cultural perspective that served to illuminate our larger American identity. Herrera grew up in California as a son of migrant farmers, which he has commented strongly shaped his work. A Washington Post article tells a story that as a child, Herrera learned to love poetry by singing about the Mexican Revolution with his mother, a migrant farm worker in California. Inspired by her spirit, he has spent his life crossing borders, erasing boundaries, and expanding the American chorus. Herrera is the author of 30 books, including collections of poetry, prose, short stories, young adult novels, and picture books for children. His latest book of poetry is Every Day We Get More Illegal. Welcome, Juan Felipe. We are thrilled that you have joined us. Well, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here with, uh, with you and the uh, American Writers Museum and all the students and teachers, everyone. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to this. Yes, definitely. So tell me about your journey that inspired this book of poems. Well, this particular book of poems, uh, this book of poems, Every Day We Get More Illegal, uh, you know, I wanted to write in a very direct fashion. I wanted to write directly at the reader. So if you, if you read it, it's, it's almost like uh, uh, the book is talking to you or the poems are talking to you. That was my goal. And because uh, otherwise, you know, I'm, I'm experimenting most of the time. I experimented quite a bit in this book, uh, but not in, not in terms of language. It was more in terms of being more direct. And, um, and of course, what I wrote about. And what inspired the book really was... Uh, you know, that feeling of every day we sense that things get more, uh, uh, they get tighter, uh, there's more restrictions, uh, in particular the migrant experience and that the, the experience of uh, all of us in general. Uh, instead of more openness, there seems to be more, uh, uh, the doors seem to be bigger and tighter and more locked up uh, in more ways than one. So I, I wanted to... Uh, to, uh, to think about that. And uh, I, wanted, I want to have the readers and everyone reflect on those things, you know, what kind of nation are we? Uh, what is America? Who are we? And to embrace this 
and it, to create the biggest embrace possible uh, for everyone and, and uh, for the whole earth and for nature and, and uh, all of us together. So that's, that's the impulse uh, in, the, in, the, in the collection. Definitely. Wonderful. <laughs> and also thinking about it, what do you think about the label illegal and the effect that it has had on the immigrant identity? Well, you know, it's not a good thing to call people illegal to begin with, you know. Yeah. Uh, acts, acts can be, actions can be illegal, perhaps. Yes, actions can be mm -hmm. illegal. Uh, but how can people be illegal? That's, we're reducing. When we call someone illegal, we're, we're reducing that human being into, who knows, into a little shred of a phrase in a piece of paper. And a human being is not a phrase in a piece of paper. A human being is a beautiful being uh, with many dimensions, not, not just a legal status, but many dimensions, a father, a mother, a child, a son, a daughter, a grandmother, a grandfather, uh, a farmer, a worker, an artist, a poet, a student. Uh, we have many dimensions, not just a few words on a piece of paper that say illegal. And I also wanted to, uh, to, uh, to invite, uh, invite uh, peace invite uh, unity as opposed to create uh, division. So those, that's, that's uh, where the title comes from and also comes from a lot of concern. Like all of us, we'll have concerns and we all notice what's going on. Uh, in particular, young people, you know, you notice everything. People, you know, not, students notice everything because they have very open, open hearts and open senses. Uh, so that's... Um, so those are some of my uh, uh, ways of uh, bringing together this poetry. Sure, and yeah, you really did humanity in people in your in your poems. Yes, I found the I found a haunting aspect to the poem "Todavía estoy aquí" that the poor father said, "He's gone, but he's still present in his shadow self." Can you talk to me about this binding connection to family and home, regardless of borders and forced separation? Well, you know, every family is a family. Mm -hmm. Every family is a family. Even if you feel distant, you're still a family. Even if you rejected somebody in the family or you just feel like you just want to be alone, you're still with that family. And when you get forcibly and violently ripped apart, imagine your feelings. Imagine. I remember being in, um, in uh, Wyoming, in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, I, I've gotten invited to go to Jackson Hole a couple of times. And I visit high schools, and I visit teachers, and I visit community centers, and I also walk around doodling around like a poet always doodles around. And you want to see the mountains, and you want to see the people, and the one, you want to see the, the city. I talked to students in this particular time, and one of the students, uh, a Latino, and I think it was like an 11th grade, and uh, probably Jackson Hole High School. I think that's perhaps the name of it, but it was a high school in Jackson Hole. And uh, he was talking about his migrant experience and this whole border division issue. And he, see, and he said that he felt as if another half of him was left behind. Yeah. Another half, he's still out there and he's also over here in the United States. But that out there part of him is still there. So it's like you're no longer whole. You're no longer one person. You're, part of you is over there. You, you live there. Your family is there or you have families there, and you're also in school here in California or in Wyoming. So you, you're kind of floating, and that's an odd feeling, and, and it works against our sense of who we are, and we, f we feel cracked and divided internally. And that creates a lot of tension, it creates anger, it creates uh, unhappiness, and that's not the way we want to be. We want uh, our peoples to be, and we want our students to be. Yeah. Yeah, much of your writing, we get a close look at these experiences. Um, which also brings me to, to, you write about terrible injustices, as in the poem, Border Fever, 105.7 Degrees, which is dedicated to migrant children that have died in custody. But in these poems, we also see possibility, you know, come with me ends with esperanza, hope. Uh, what do you say about that contrast? Well, those are, the, those are realities in our lives, aren't they? They're realities mm -hmm. in our lives. You know, uh, we, we want to be together. We want to invite people into our lives. 
we want to create a very intimate relationship with uh, with what's going on and with each other. Uh, we want to be close. We want to have friends. It's so joyful, don't you think, to have yeah. friends and go for a run and make funny sounds with your, you know, <laughs> with your voice <laughs> and scream, and also be, you know, really have a great conversation about what's really how you're really feeling. Uh, but then again, uh, let's say your little brother got taken away at the border. And all of a sudden you can't have those conversations because you're, you're so concerned about your little brother and that little brother gets taken to a jail. Imagine how you would feel. And then that little brother gets a fever or a little sister and no one, no one takes care of your little sister or little brother. And the fever keeps on going up and up and up and up till it hits 105.7. And then that little child dies. So, you know, it's good to write about those that are suffering because we want to give, uh, we want to talk about them because it wasn't right. So we want to bring that out into the world and say, look, we have to stop this behavior of taking people apart and look at this child. What did he do? What did she do? What did she do? Nothing. And what happened to her? Everything. And what happened? Where is she now? She passed away. She's no longer there. So that's, um, I get into that because I want to, um, I just don't want to talk about, you know, fun things and experimental things. I love to experiment with language. I mean, that's my delight. It's like painting a car or painting a mural, <laughs> a car. Uh, but I also want to talk about reality. See, we just live in that candy world. It's okay. Those are beautiful colors. Candy colors, you know, they're purple and blue yeah. and pink. Mm -hmm. And, you know, trolls, you know, the movies. And that's great. I love those colors. My granddaughter just goes bananas. But we also have to look at reality. We can't run from it. If we run from it, we don't face it. We're not going to be full human beings. There's pain, and then there's pleasure, and there's happiness. So as human beings, we have to work all of that. We have to face the pain. Those that are outside our family in particular, we have to reach way out there, way out there. Otherwise, we're working inside a small bubble, a tiny box. What kind of human being is that? We'll have fun. We'll enjoy but it'll be a little tiny box. And guess what happens? We're not going to grow and become full human beings. But why? Because we miss reality. And what is reality? It has pain, suffering, joy, happiness, many cultures, many languages, many religions, many people, LGBTQ+. It has all that. So full human being embraces the entire, uh, the entire world, all of humanity. And then you'll feel what happiness really is. So I don't want to forget about that, and I know you don't either, so, and that's why I write about it. Wonderful, thank you. And we also, uh, you also peer into some of the possible causes. In your poems, there are references to mechanisms of detachment moments, the machinery of the border control, the apparatus under the wall, the weaponized hormigas. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about these inhuman systems that you observe? Well, you see, you see, you see where I go now. You see what yeah. I've been writing now. <laughs> we have to, we have, <laughs> you know, you know, Christina. We have to examine everything. You know, sure. as, right? We have to examine stuff. You know, I, I always have walked around. You know, people, you know, be, making jokes, and I love to be funny, as you can tell. Mm -hmm. In high school, you know, I, I draw cartoons on my papers. I'm gonna write in a paper. You know. I'm, Philosophy paper, summer school. I lived a block from summer school. So, you know, I went, I took summer classes because what am I going to do, you know, next to a barbershop? You know, go to a barbershop and get haircuts all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I took a philosophy class, and um, I love that class, you know, Schopenhauer, Descartes. It's just on and on. I just fell in love with that kind of thinking, deep thinking and sure. examination. I hope I'm, I hope I'm going to get the point here. <laughs> so I would, put in a, I would put in a paper and I put cartoons on the margins. Then I would say, yeah. well, Professor Whiteman, um, it's okay if I put cartoons on my paper? He said, oh, come on, for sure. Just turn in your paper, will you? Uh, and so I, I, I like to be funny and draw cartoons, but uh, I also like to uh, 
to investigate. And this whole idea of the border system, I said, what is yeah. it? You know, what is that thing? Okay, there's borders, sure. all right. Uh-huh, there's a wall. There's a wall. Uh-huh. And there's a, a, a immigration custody patrol, ICE, and there's border yeah. agents. I know them since I was a child. I mean, I faced that crossing the border, and I faced it in California with my parents. Sure. But what, what is it really, right, students, right? right? You know, we want to find out what is that thing. Uh, and it really is a system, and it's connected to everything else we do. And the physical border is all over the United States, as you know. You can you can drive from uh, El Paso, Texas, uh, north to uh, Colorado, and you're going to run into more border stops with dogs and with border patrol and with cameras and with uh, interrogation beyond the U.S.-Mexican border official border. So it's a complete system, and it's also how we think. Don't forget, it really is who we are. Those borders reflect who we are. Why? Because we agree to it. We, we're not, you know, right now we're not complaining about it. And that's an agreement. Silence is an agreement. So, so we're all involved in what that border is. And what it turns out to be is who we are. Everything that's, that we approve of is who we are, right? You say, hey, I, I, I really like that ice cream, that triple colored ice cream. I love that. So that represents who you are, what you like sure. and what you love. So, so that's what I'm doing. With, that's what I say about the border as a system. And uh, it's also connected to, to violence. A lot of violence takes place at the border. I know uh, uh, many of us approve of the border, but it also contains violence. And I don't think you approve of the violence. Uh, physical abuse, abuse of women, abuse of children, uh, and on, you know. It's, if you want to approve the border, then approve of uh, a more compassionate border. Then. However, I want to think of a new kind of nation because we need to think of the, you know, the new generation. We all need to think of, of the new idea. We're here for to create a new idea of who we are, not just the same idea. You don't want the idea of my generation from the 60s. That was a fun generation. <laughs> you want a 21st century idea. And what is it? Is it the same? Is it just another stronger, more highly funded idea that, uh, the, of the border and who we are as America? Or do you want a new idea, a more compassionate idea, a more inclusive idea? See, that's where you come in. So analysis is always important. Asking yourself, who are we? Who am I? Uh, how do I perceive the world? What is real for me? And what is fantasy for me? And what is good for me? And what is right for me? And what is right in society? And what's not working in society? And what, how can I bring about, how can I affect that? How can I bring my uh, values, my positive values, into play with my writing. Because who else has, has the kind of writing instruments that you do? Very few people. Tablets and computers and cell phones and, 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 and all the systems and programming of, a, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the technology. And who knows it more than students and professors that teach in schools and here at the Writing Museum? Not everybody. Very few people. We would think everybody does. Not true. And globally, very few people. So, so you have the technology, you have the new, the new fresh brains, and you have the teachers and the schools and the libraries and all the books and all the studies. So who's going to have that new idea? Most likely, you have access to creating that new idea. And that's why I speak of the border in those ways. I'm trying to come up with a uh, a new way of talking about it, and perhaps change. That's what we're after. We're always after change. Yes. And you have so much experience as an activist. Um, has that really shaped your writing, being an activist, uh, move, to move forward in action? Uh, yes, it has. You know, uh, when, I, when I went to uh, UCLA out of uh, high school, imagine me. I never thought I was going to go to UCLA. I was just diddling around the hall, and my counselor said, Hey, Juan, what are you doing in the hall? Uh, I'm just hanging out with Oscar. 
well, you know, you should be at uh, Mrs. Cunningham's office. I go, oh, because, you know, she has applications for UCLA. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, they're given affirmative action uh, scholarships, four years, one, you're great, they're, you know, they're okay. Uh, okay, Mr. Weiss, uh, okay. So that was me. <laughs> I filled it out, and then I got a big old giant envelope, two-pound envelope, I said, hey, congratulations. Uh, you're invited to the student orientation, and we look forward to seeing you in the fall. Uh, so I had never been in a university, and my mother only went to third grade, uh, being a farm worker, uh, and my father never went to school at all. He was born in 1882. So what kind of schools were, did you have in 1882, you know? Especially if you're just a laborer, you work with your hands all the time. There was no, no schools, no schools. Working on the railroad was his school. Uh, working in the ranches in Wyoming was his school. And always being a farm worker all his life, all his life, in his 70s. Farm worker, imagine, 100, 102 degrees, and with your bed, just bent down chopping uh, grapes at, all day. I couldn't do five minutes. At, you know, so um, I've always been concerned about uh, uh, people, uh, about because I grew up in a family that kind of went through tough times. So then I said, I want to change. I want to change that. And also when I was at UCLA, um, the farm workers movement came into being. Uh, you know, the wages, uh, the treatment, the pesticides, the pay, and all that, and uh, the suffering of uh, farm workers. I go, I don't want that to be the way that is. And by that time, I had kind of finally got up on, you know, in front of campus, uh, in campus, standing up and, and reciting poems as best as I could. Don't, don't, don't think I was Mr. Smoothie up there. Okay. My voice, you know, my voice gargled and squeaked. Uh, I sounded like Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. And, uh, but I, I attempted it because I had this kind of burning need to just get it out. Because I grew up, I grew up on the outside of towns and, and the little trailers. And I never was inside a town, right? You always want to be inside. Like at high school, you go, hey, how's it going? Yeah, all right. Uh-huh, what do you think? Yeah. You want to be with friends. But when you're outside, well, you don't really have friends because you're way outside of everything. You may have people you see in school, but then you got to go all the way out there. And that's it. Uh, so, so by the time I was at UCLA, I was ready to to say stuff uh, because I had swallowed it, you know, many a time. So that's how it works, you know. Yeah. So we got to speak up. Uh, speak up with a kind heart, yes. Absolutely. And you want to say your writing career is so prolific, as we have uh, mentioned, short stories, poetry, novels, so many genres. What's your writing practice that makes this possible? Well, I write every day, and I scribble mm -hmm. every day, and I have all kinds of paper and pens and colored pencils. I might as well, you know, just li live in this little studio that you're looking at. Um, I try not to, because, you know, I have a family, by the way, <laughs> and oh. grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Yes. 14, gra 14 grandchildren. How many wow. is that? Great. 14. <laughs> and there are four great-grandchildren. One, two, three, four. And uh, so... But I, 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 I write a lot and scribble. You know, don't think I write these big papers every day. I just scribble, put a few words on paper, and just follow. I just follow those words. And I draw big circles with, with uh, markers, you know, big old circles. Then I, I, you know, draw across them like a pizza. And then I write on the, on the spokes of, of the inner circle in, in a color pen. I just like doing that. Maybe it's 10 words worth. And then I, you know, take a big old sheet of paper. It's newsprint. Then I write, draw, I, I write one as best as, as often as I can. And the reason I write for children and toddlers and, and middle school and uh, adults and all that is because I, I, I figure if I, if I can, no one says stop, by the way, right? If someone says stop writing, I'll go, I'll probably stop for a little bit and wonder why they say that. But if not, I want to continue so if you don't see a stop sign, don't create one for yourself. Uh, explore. 
that's what we are. We're explorers. So I, I made an attempt to write for middle school. It's called, in high school, it's called Crash Boom Love. <laughs> it's, it's a heavy book. <laughs> wow. It's called Crash Boom Love. And there's a big old crash in there. And it hurts, it really hurts uh, the people in it badly, badly. And there's one called Skate Fate. I gave this one my best. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I was a skateboarder, so <laughs> I looked at that, it was great. <laughs> hey, that's, I couldn't do it. I, I, you're, you're brave. I couldn't do it. I'd be flying out of that skateboard. So the more, the more we experiment, the more audiences we reach. And that's what we're here for as writers, to, to reach audiences and, and families. But, but congratulations, congratulations on skateboarding. Thank you. I don't do it anymore. I'm all trapped here. <laughs> well, these are the questions I have for today so far. Um, would you like to read for us now? Yeah, sure. For Thank sure. I'd like, I like to read for you. Do you want me to yes. read out of Crash Boom Love? Do you want me to read out of Skate Fake? Or do you want me to read out of uh, Every Day We Get More Illegal? Well, let's start with Every Day We Get More Illegal. Okay, let's start with Every Day We Get More Illegal. And remember, this is a book kind of addressed to the reader, sure. uh, addressed to America. And um, mm -hmm. so let me read you just, let me read you the first, the very first one. It's called America, We Talk About It. Every day of the week. It is not easy. First, I had to learn over decades to take, to take care of myself. Are you listening? I had to learn. I had to gain pebble by pebble, seashell by seashell, the courage to listen to myself, my true inner self. For that, I had to push you aside. It was not easy. I had pushed aside my mother, my father, myself, and that artificial way, that artificial stairway of becoming you, to be inside of you. After years, I realized perhaps too late, there was no way I could bring them back. I could not rewind the clock, but I did. I could do one thing, I could care. Now we are here. So that's the opening poem. Wonderful. I also want to remind our audience that we're going to go into Q&A pretty soon. So just click into the Q&A box, uh, write your question in, and don't forget to put your name and the school that you're from. Oh, yeah. And read a little bit more and have the questions come in. OK. You want me to read some more or have the Yeah, question? let's read some more. Uh, you want to read from one of the high school books or mix okay. it up? Uh -huh. Okay, here we go with Crash Boom Love. Great, thank you. you you're just fully 100% welcome. And this is called Broken Fingernails. How does that sound? That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> this takes place outside of, a, outside of high school. Right on the outside where there's a little, you know, little markets and little places to, to do stuff. And the character is, uh, his friend, his character's name is Caesar, and his friend is called Miguel. Miguel and I walk without saying a word. We walk as if underwater, as if we were dead leaves or algae floating to the other side of the shore. I can feel a wave from behind me about to suck me into its icy depths. I'm going down, empty, Sad, sad desert behind Lucky's mini mart. The new guy circles me, the new guy at school. The new guy circles me, his hand flapping in front of him, fanning, fanning air into his face. Dark, head shaved, he stares and burns his eyes. The mini mart is our basilica, a dirt palace where our bodies cross and go up in flames. New guy floats. Here's my altar. Here's my mirror. I have seen his face before. Hard, glassy, reddish eyes, his high cheekbones and his tight lips, his small ears, ready to track any sound, a raindrop, a wisp of sand. And his nose, thin, a bit hooked, his forehead clean, smooth, blank. He is sure. 
His shoulders are small, proud box and brown, long strides. He moves like a cat, a dark spinning fur with his eye and with eyes that holler and growl and spark torches without a word. I can see Sammy in the circle. Sammy's a friend of his. I can see Sammy in the circles around us. I can see Miguel in his tiny void frames. He wrings his hands like towels and Lulu, bow-legged in white overalls, jelly pumps, and Carlos Johnson, another dude, heads, headphones on, quiet. And Miguel Ortega snarls, hollers to the new guy, kick his butt. He's a scrapa, a wetback, and he spits on me. He swings and slams my nose. He swings and I go down to the dirt, chokes me, bashes my head against the ground. I'm drinking dirt and little pieces of wood. My face is dragging against pebbles and rocks, tears and hot blood and laughter, slapping hands, high fives and long stretched voices. Cries circle and cries circle around me. My mother's face, who knows crooked English, English, and my father's face, who leaves me in a knot in my empty living room back home. And Mrs. Tinko, my teacher, and Mr. Santos, my teacher, who doesn't speak Spanish, and Shane, who stomps on my new shoes, and my naked body that everybody sees in a veil of steam and shame, sprawled on the sand in the dark copper light. Lulu lunges toward me. Stop it, man, it's over, all right? Ya estuvo, that's it, she yells out. Come on, Chavala, the new guy tears my shirt. Let's finish it, come on. Jump back to the circle of hits and gravel bites and heat and slams. Lulu pulls me back hard. Her black fingernails break off. Maybe I'm my mother's womb again. Maybe I'm about to be born, about to die. I'm alone. My knuckles raw, my face watery. Everyone's gone. Everyone except Miguel. Miguel Sotzil. Thank you so much. Isn't that cool? It's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. When you fight in the school and, and get slammed. But, you know, I wanted to make it a, as, as real as I could. It's not a, it's not a pretty scene. Yeah. Oh. Well, I think we're ready to start into some questions from our audience. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, you can still write in your questions. Just click on the Q&A box, uh, type your question up. And don't forget to put your name and the school that you're from. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Kalia. My name is Kalia from Argo Community High School. I write poetry, but I have a fear of speaking in front of an audience. How do I overcome that fear? Well, I know that fear. I had it, I had it many, many, many years. And you just got to get yourself up there. You know, you know what I did to get it to, to, to at least... Throw my, you've got to throw yourself in the fire, basically. And you know what was my fire in middle school? Because in middle school, I just felt what you're feeling. I just couldn't handle it anymore. The teacher would look at me and go, oh, no, he's going to ask me a question. Oh, God. And I would start, my heart would beat and I would start sweating. Or somebody asked me a question, i go, oh, man. Or, you know, people had conversations and I didn't know how to get in a conversation. I had all that. So you know what I did in seventh, uh, in seventh grade? You know what school I, uh, what class I registered for eighth grade? Choir. Because I knew that choir was going to make me stand up and sing in front of people. So you got to throw yourself out there. Uh, you know, you can read, get, your, get a poetry book at home. I used to get in front of a mirror. Imagine that. So I would recite my book in front of a mirror and I would do my hands like this. I was Mr. Mr. Fabulous by myself in front of a mirror. But eventually I, I, I threw myself into the fire, into a choir. And little by little, you know, you gotta sing, you gotta stand up. And then I got on stage because you're in a choir. And then I did a performance in front of the, um, the assembly because you're in a choir. So little by little, it took, me like, it took me like four or five years, but you gotta do it, do it, do it. And just let go, you know, get the fear out of your head. You know what fear is? It's dirty furniture, and it's in your head, and it's in your way. Every time you look out, the furniture, the dirty furniture of fear is in front of you. Just get rid of it. Turn that channel off and get into the real you, the happy, old you. It's, you have it, but you got to do it. you got to step into it as often as you can. 
You know, I want to say something in class. Oh God, I don't know. What I'm gonna get. To, I'm gonna try it. At least I'll say hi to the teacher. Hello, Mr. Whiteman. Uh, 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 I have a question. That's what you gotta do, and do it with your poems. Share it with a friend. Share it with a friend, and then keep on moving. Oh man, it was tough. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our next uh, question is from Taya. Goes to Argo Community High School. If you didn't become a writer or poet, what would you have done instead? Uh, let me see. Let me see. Uh, I would have become a painter. I would have gone into art art school because I love art, and I wanted to get into sculpture at, at the university. But you know, sometimes you love something you don't know you love it. You see, some. Sometimes you like to dance, and you're the dancer of the century, but you don't know you, you like it. You just do it. You don't know you're good at it because you just do it. And sometimes you like to uh, analyze things. Well, you know what? You know, there's more to it than that, Jason. You know, if you really think about it, you know, you have to think about the, you know, the energy part. You didn't think about the energy. And all of a sudden, you don't know you have a very analytical mind. But So you, we have to become kind of aware of what it is we like and what it is we get a lot of joy in when we're in school, you know, middle school, high school. Not what we should do, even though that's appreciated, but what, what you really like. And I really liked art, art class. I just love my art class. Watercolors and painting and the history of the Renaissance painters. To this day, I have those, those paintings and books around me. I love those guys and Van Gogh. So become, uh, uh, become more aware of what you really like, not, not what you should like. And um, that was that the, that I answer more or less. <laughs> so I would be a painter, I would be a sculptor, and but I didn't. I just the lines were so long at UCLA to get into mm -hmm. a, an art class. I I never got in. So I got into anthropology, but I was since I was working with my voice all along, I I started to write poetry because poetry is cool because when you're alone like I was, you're kind of talking on paper and you're kind of getting out your feelings on paper, like a journal. So then automatically I went from there to, uh, to reciting the poems and to where I'm at now. But enjoy what you like and become more aware of what you really enjoy and see if you can find a channel for it. Dance, art, uh, analysis, technology, a doctor. Do you really like to care for others? You really want to care for others. You're good at caring. Well, think about medicine. Don't worry about. Oh, I can't do it. I I don't like chemistry. Get that get that fear furniture out of your head. Turn the channel into the positive channel, and then follow what you really love. That was a long answer. <laughs> Great. Um, so we have a question from Matilda North Park University in Chicago. I wonder what book or uh, work collection you're most proud of, and as a follow-up, what book, work, collection do you think that makes a best impact and difference for your audience? You, you mean my book or books? Uh, books in general, overall. What book? Uh, what oh, sorry. Yeah, your uh, books that you're most proud of for yourself. Oh. Impact uh, it has made. I, I like, uh, you know, I just discovered that I like my first book a lot. Um, uh, but the one I, I, you know, they're all they're all cool because they're all you. Remember that? They're all you at different points in your life. So it's kind of hard to just like one because that was you back in a few years ago. And yesterday you wrote something new. And you really like that because it's kind of closer to you. But they're all who you are. So it's good to like them all. <laughs> but sometimes one stands up. So look, this is my first book. And, and, and there's drawings in it. And it's, and it's bilingual. It was so fun to write bilingually. And we're so used to writing in one language, aren't we? That's okay. And you're good at that. Beautiful. You know, English is hard. For, if we were from another country and attempted to write English, it's hard because we have all these funky words that don't, they, you don't write them the way they sound, like thorough. Why isn't that written T-H-O-R-O, -O, thorough? No, it's not written that way. So it's a T A you know, thorough, you know, O G H. What's a G doing in thorough? <laughs> but 
but only only uh, we're only conscious of one language, you know, typically. Uh, but we can we're also bilingual, and we can be trilingual. And actually, the new idea is to be multilingual. That's the new idea, because because the world has many peoples, and if we're not a world person, then we're not going to be able to uh, think uh, of humanity. We want to th- we want to be part of humanity. We're part of humanity, but consciously we need to expand our way of being aware of humanity and participate in humanity. So this was a bilingual, uh, bilingual book, and it's one of my favorites because it was so generous. I'll read you three lines. Let us gather in a flourishing way, with sun loose grains abriendo los cantos, opening the songs, and that que cargamos cada día that we carry every day. Let us gather in a flourishing way, with sunlight grains opening the songs that we carry every day. I, I haven't written like that in decades. And I really like that positive uh, voice that we need today. So I encourage you to write uh, poems of hope, poems of unity, and poems of, uh, of love. I bet you if you did that and you read it and turned it in or made an assembly or put a club together or just read it to friends, they would probably, you know, giggle. We can go, oh, yeah, writing about love. But you can tell that we need love just by looking at the television or looking at what's going on. We need a positive voice. So I like this one a lot. It's called Rebosos of Love, Shawls of Love. And the collections, um, I like my children's book collections because uh, I write for children. And they get a big, they laugh it all up when I say just one word like, I walk in the classroom and I say, cilantro. Everybody just, oh, he said cilantro, teacher. Oh, I can't believe it. He said cilantro. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, uh, elementary school uh, classes are a lot of fun if you write for young children. And I encourage you to write for young children. You see, we write only in English. Okay, good. But the more languages we know, the more languages we can write in. Uh, uh, we haven't thought of writing for children. I encourage you to. Because then you can visit them, and then you can share your experience with children. And then they're aware of who you are. You go, oh, teacher, he's a high school student. He goes, high school, high school, high school. You see, you open doors for children just by visiting the children and writing for children. And that's what we want to do. We want to open doors, open doors, open doors. Unless you want to live in a closet, it's kind of dark in there. And, you know, there's funny sounds in there. And uh, hangers will get in your nose, and, you know, stick on your nose. And uh, you can get locked up in there, and then you can't get out. It's not a good idea. Open doors, best deal. And there's Olivia. Or is it? No. Ore, Ulua. Huh? Who knows? Yes. Who you tell me? <laughs> uh, that's Beautiful true. name. Uh, yeah, we have a question from Ahibola from Chicago Math and Science Academy. What do you like about poetry and what do you dislike about poetry? <laughs> I like everything about poetry. Uh, see, poetry is investigation. Poetry is thinking. Poetry is uh, your inner self. Uh, poetry is uh, kind of the molecules of language. You know, you're playing with, uh, with molecules, isotopes, atoms, as you're moving words around. You're playing with sound. Imagine, I know you all uh, work on computers and you see the sound waves. And you can adjust sounds and cut and edit uh, uh, a phrase. And you can see all the, uh, you know, the high and the low frequencies. Uh, so that's what, that's what poetry also is. It's frequencies of sound. And you can move them around. If you move around a word from the beginning to, to the middle or to the almost end or end to the end, and you switch the, the terms around, you're switching the sound uh, frequencies. Uh, so that's also interesting. Uh, but most of all, it's, um, it's speaking and uh, recalling. You can recall a family member that passed away uh, or someone uh, that you care for or ancestors and, and present them to the public and give them life. 
and extend their life into the future because th- your books are going to be somewhere in the big cloud. And the cloud continues about that. So it's a way to extend life for those that passed on, for them to be remembered. It's a, a sound frequency science world. It's also a world of thinking, of uh, creating uh, your thinking that you haven't put out. You know, once you write it, uh, uh, the thoughts come to you. And you say, yeah, I really want to think of what's going on. I don't know. So you put some words down. Like this morning, I go, let's see, what's, what's, what kind of nation is this? What kind of nation do I want? And I said, I want a prismatic nation. I just, it just came to me, you know, a prismatic nation. That includes all colors. It includes all nations. It includes all cultures. And it just shines from different facets. How about that? Instead of binary nation, us against them, us separate from them. I don't think I want a binary nation. I think I want a prismatic nation. How did I do that? Well, how did I start that? By putting words on paper. So it's an, it's an experimental lab also. So it's not just words and a message and devices of rhyme and meter and metaphor and simile and many other great things. It's all those other things. And it can, you know why? Because it's you. If you were just one thing, and then it would just be one thing. But you are many things with many dimensions, uh, and they all come into the into play when you write a poem. It's different than writing a report. A report is also you, but it's a little more. It's a stricter format, and a poem is a, a boundless format. That's why I like it. Enjoy that. Yeah. That's true. That's true. And I remind everyone one more time: um, if you have questions, you can write it in into the Q and A box. Be sure to put your name and uh, the school that you're from. Uh, next question is from Ore Olua from Chicago Math and Science Academy. How did you start believing in your work? Believing in your work, uh, it kind of, it's kind of automatic, but it's also not automatic. It's both. It's automatic and not automatic. Uh, you believe in your work once you read it. So once, once you start it, you're believing in it. Uh, and then that's kind of organic, an organic belief. Once you start dancing, you're believing in dancing, right? And once you start speaking out and responding to questions in class or doing assignments uh, kind of uh, more, more fluidly, then you're believing in that. <laughs> you're believing in doing your assignments. But um, there's also a point where you go, God, is, am I really a poet? Am I really a writer? Uh, am I really worthy of going to a college? I don't think so, because you're not believing in yourself. So I see that's another level of belief. And, and that one comes from, you got to get rid of that negative furniture, remember? You, oh, no, I can't do it. No, I didn't study enough. It's too late. Uh, I really can't write. You know, I can't really spell. Uh, and, you know, uh, I, I just want to go get a job. You know, because this is just way over, I'm done, I'm done, I'm fried. You know, all that is negative furniture. We carry it. Imagine your, your mind filled with negative furniture, old sofas and broken chairs and cracked windows. And you're trying, to, you're trying to go through there. It's difficult. So we have to just get, pull it away. Don't think about yesterday. Don't think about tomorrow. Just... Uh, believe in yourself, but you have to uh, uh, attempt it. You, see the, you, know, you say, oh, I believe in myself. You have to attempt it. You have to act it, act it out, speak it out, do it. Stand up tall. You know, you live, you know I'm not going to run like this. You got to stand up tall and you got to speak out. You're not going to shout or scream. Just speak out. You know, say, today I really enjoyed talking about poetry. Or you know what? I like poetry, but to tell you the truth, I like cartoons better. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad you spoke out, right? So you have to ignite. Uh, you have to start your ignition. You got to turn your ignition key on, <laughs> and 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 say what you want to say, and be intimate. You know, it's hard to. It's fun. It's easy to be loud, also, but it's difficult and challenging to be personal. You know, today I'm, I'm really feeling 
I'm really feeling great today. I don't know why, but all of a sudden today I feel really good. It's difficult to say that, but say it. And then you, you'll get in touch with, with your heart, with your positive self. All that needs to be explored. And the more we do it, um, the better for everybody. Yeah. Um, our next question is from Sylvia from Madison East High School in Madison, Wisconsin. How do you know when writing too much info is too much without exposing your familia, status, fuerte familia issues, etc.? Fuerte familia, fuerte familia issues. Well, write about the issues. Write about the issues. Uh, without, we don't, we, don't, we don't have to bring, you know, my, my grandma in here or my dad, you know. But we can bring them in as characters uh, with different names. Right? Characters with different names. And sometimes we really want to get into uh, the detail of the pain or the detail of, the, of abandonment or the detail, uh, there's detail of alcoholism. There's a lot of detail, or just detail of our parents, you know, just as they are. You know, we had a hard time growing up and this is how we live. It doesn't have to have all those um, more painful issues. Sometimes it does. But maybe it's just bringing our family. Just, you know, uh, it's good to give them their due, you know. But if they're difficult, uh, like you say, um, issues, then uh, then just you can either just change the na- change the names, uh, uh, for sure. And you could also change the perspective of the writer, the point of view of the writer. You don't have to say my father. You can say you could create another character. So, uh, for example, I don't know. Uh, um, uh, Dolores uh, had a father. And uh, he, al- he always left home. And Dolores began to feel sad. But you see, this is not you. This is another point of view, speaking about Dolores and Dolores' father. So it's not direct. It's another character in your story, t- telling the story of a fictional Dolores, of a fictional father. And yet the story really is more personal for the writer. See, so you find different points of view and the information, we don't want all of the information. We don't want a big old downer story, <laughs> but we do want a real story. So test yourself to see where you start feeling uncomfortable and leave it there. Don't go, don't go all out, just begin to tell your story or the story you want to tell. And whenever you've kind of start feeling uncomfortable, then just stop right there. You probably have already said enough. Or if you want to go all out, go all out and keep it to yourself and get it out. And then come back and write another version uh, that represents that, but from another point of view, with other names, uh, with another location, and yet it's true for you. Mm-hmm. That's what I think. Thank you. Uh, and, you can- and, that, and that's something positive. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sorry. Good questions. Good yes, questions. Yeah, bro, you can still bring in more questions. Uh, just yeah. put them into the Q&A box. And uh, don't forget to put your name and the school that you're from. Um, so our next question is from Lisbeth uh, from North Park University. I was wondering what would be your one piece of advice to undocumented students to continue working hard even when they feel unmotivated? Well, that's a difficult, that's a difficult um, reality that you're talking about. Undocumented, working hard, even when we're unmo- you're unmotivated, when we're unmotivated. To work hard even without motivation. It's great to have motivation to work hard. And sometimes we work hard because we know something else is taking place. Imagine not having papers just for 10 minutes. If everyone here didn't have a license, it would, how would you feel, right? If for just 10 minutes, everyone right here today, right now, you had lost your license, you had lost your credit card, you lost it all, and all of a sudden, you don't have your papers. Just all of a sudden, don't you feel odd? You go, oh God, I gotta get that license. And that's just a license. But you know, all of a sudden, people, you're going to need it. You're not going to have it. 
and you're going to be asked for it, and you can't function. But this is an undocument, being undocumented, not having papers to be in the country, and then having to go to work and feeling, hey. So, so how, do, how do you deal with that? Well, you'd have to answer that one. How do, you, how do we create motivation when we're feeling uh, under the microscope all the time or when we're feeling incomplete? How do we do that? Come on, I want you to all think about it because uh, I, I don't have the answers. How do we do that? We need support. We need encouragement. We need uh, friendship. Uh, we need a positive environment, but it's hard because we have to have it inside. But support internally, what do we do internally? We got, we got to get that negative furniture out once again. There's more, there's more of it. Because any moment, any moment you can be uh, asked, quite interrogated. As a poet laureate, I got interrogated uh, on, on the plane. You know, who, wait, can you please come over here? And then the person showed up, showed a badge, not in the plane, in the jetway, to the plane. After you leave the ticket counter, before you get in the plane, right, you got to walk to that little tunnel right there. Uh, sir, can you please come here? Okay. Uh, uh, can I see your ID? Mm hmm Where are you going? Um, Iowa. Where are you coming from? Uh, right here, uh, uh, Idaho. Uh, what were you doing? I was reading. Uh, what were you reading? At the library. Mm -hmm. And what are you going to do when you get to Idaho? Well, I'm going to check in at a hotel and I have another reading there. Uh -huh. And what do you do anyway? Uh, I'm a poet. Hmm. All right, you can go. But I had my license, imagine? So without that. Um, it's a hard one to answer. Let me say this. I love you. I support you. I believe in you. All of us here support you. All of us here uh, want you to succeed. All of us here encourage you, all of us here are for you. That's, that's my answer. Thank you so much, Juan Felipe. The words are so inspiring. And um, well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're happy to have had so many members and students join us. If you'd like to purchase a book, Every Day We Get More Legal, through our book selling partner, yeah. Seminary Co-op. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, okay. but thank you again, Juan Felipe. Well, 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 well. A wonderful mm -hmm. conversation. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And we will see everyone back again for our next program. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead.